Well, everybody, we did it. One million Bitcoin addresses with one Bitcoin or more. And to me, this is actually a very positive thing to take a look at as the market progresses. Now, right now, it's not a very interesting market. I will give you that. Uh, this week has been uh, been some pretty interesting news that's going on. But this we kind of suffer from the, uh, the, the ho-hum drums of the things that are going on in the market. But this, I think, will give you a little bit of perspective. So... There was a report that just came out, and this came over from looking at Bitcoin, a little alert that uh, flashed in my inbox, that uh, right now, addresses with a balance of more than one Bitcoin is at one million addresses. Now, I have to preface it with this. Even though we have one million addresses with one Bitcoin or more, that does not mean that there are one million people with one Bitcoin. For example, I personally have multiple ledgers. I have multiple Bitcoin addresses. So just because this says there's one, I myself am responsible for four to seven of those. So take it with a grain of salt, but it is interesting how things are moving up and to the right. And if we actually zoom in here, we're going to see that just about a year ago for the addresses part, we were at 834,000. I mean, roughly April 26 or so, go for 836. And as the price of Bitcoin starts to go down, you can see that people start to accumulate a little bit more. And of course, this happens uh, as time goes on. And then, of course, right now, if we're looking at just into uh, the ad, the website is lookingatbitcoin.com, link in the description. Great website. It's got uh, everything for free, high quality charts. It actually top out, tops out at 999,341. However, if we take a look at Glassnode, we can see that it has touched that million person mark of one Bitcoin or more. So me personally, I think this is, like I always say, a step in the right direction. Also, it's not just one Bitcoin. It's if we take a look at just wallets or addresses with more than one Bitcoin, uh, you've got, if we just take a look at 2010, it was 57,000. And we just keep going up and to the right. 2023, 1 million. Now, if we go into some smaller uh, denominations, 0 0.1 Bitcoin, we're still going up. So people are still accumulating. And then again, at 0 0.01, which, hey, if you got that, you're going to be way ahead of, I mean, almost a ton of the millionaires out there that haven't gotten into this game. We're sitting at 12 million. So again, things are moving in the right direction. We hear bad news. We hear about these, uh, these things that are going on. We kind of lose perspective. When in doubt, zoom out, look at the big picture, things are going on. So I see all these things happening with Bitcoin and there's a lot of people that are accumulating and sticking with some like, well, I wonder how people are using it for, are they using it for transactions? Is it a store of value? Well, if we take a look at Bitcoin active addresses, we can see that usually in the, in the bull markets, we can see here in 2017, uh, as the price starts to heat up, then people start to move Bitcoin around, probably because they're selling, let's just be honest. So they sold in 2017, dropped off, it may have been used for uh, exchanges or may have been used for uh, a, a method of, of exchange. And then going up to the next bull run, 2021, same thing. We saw a massive amount of, of people moving things around and it dropped off. And then here we go, kind of sideways action. And then all of a sudden, bing, just drops off the face of the planet. I thought to myself, why, are, why did the addresses go so low so quickly? This is an... Uh, this this week here. And I thought, well, maybe it's because of this. Binance is pulling out of Canada. I don't know if you had heard about this, but Binance is saying that because of regulatory pressures and issues, they will not be staying in Canada and completely pulled out along with other crypto exchanges. Now, Kraken has stayed, but Binance being one of the largest exchanges out there in the world said that it, it went out. This happened yesterday, May 12th on Friday. And they said it was because of investor limits and mandatory registrations. So I don't understand the major difference between uh, KYC and AML in Canada and what we have in the USA. But uh, there are issues and it all comes down to regulation. So the next question that I had was, well, well why, why are these active addresses or people not transacting in Bitcoin? And it can be something as simple as this. <laughs> it's expensive. It's pricey. This is BitInfo charts. And you can see the average transaction fee uh, has been quite a bit. And once it starts to top out, right now, let's see, it was uh, the average transaction fee for Bitcoin. This was on May 8th, we talked about, $31. And then, of course, it just dropped off a cliff. Now we can see the same thing over here. So sideways, 
dropped off a cliff. And that could just be that people are like, hey, uh, I'm sick of using Bitcoin as transactions because it's just way too expensive. Now, this is a little bit better than Ethereum, but this is what we have. And then before we move on to the next piece, I will say this, that because of Binance pulling out of Canada, it's all because of regulation. We're also seeing a lot of things that are happening in America because of Gary Gensler and the SEC and their, their ridiculous crackdown of crypto. But as they start to pull out these big companies, these VCs, the people that are investing in crypto, it just causes a vacuum for them to go someplace else. This is from Decrypt, uh, the Mika, the new reg the regulation from Europe. It spurs a surge in VC funding for EU-based crypto startups. And why do they do that? Because they gave clarity and positive clarity, to, to be uh, quite honest. So this one, a little bit of context. An influx of VC funding has flowed into the European crypto market over the past couple of months. Executives said it's because of the landmark crypto regulation in the EU. How much so? Well, Patrick Hansen, EU policy director at USDC, says VC investment in the European crypto projects is up almost 10x in one year. Let me say that again. VC investment in European crypto projects, almost 10x in one year. When did that happen? A lot of it happened because they knew there's going to be positive crypto regulation with MICA, and it actually happened. So America can keep screwing around and do the things they want to do, but it'll just cause a vacuum and it'll go some other places like what is happening right there. So that to me is, to me, it's a neutral news on that one. I'm happy for Europe, but you know, America is just slowly dying in crypto. But also one good thing here in America, two states. First of all, the great state of Texas I live in, they introduced a bill to ban CBDCs and also Ron DeSantis uh, who is the governor of Florida, uh, passed his legislation to ban central bank digital currencies. And here is what I will say on this lastly. Even though they may put a regulation out that says we're going to ban CBDCs, that's great, that's fine, that's dandy. But unfortunately here in the States, it doesn't really mean too much. If the state bans a CBDC, but the U.S. government comes on and says, look, we're going to make this legal tender, we're going to put it all across the entire country, uh, that ban will not hold water. However, there are some things that they can do. They could just say, well, if you're going to want to do that and use a CBDC and allow that privacy to be exploited and everything out there in the open, we're going to let you do that. But if you want to use a CBDC here in Florida or here in Texas or another state, you're going to pay a tax. And that is a CBDC tax. And they can say, you know what, we're going to tax you 30% for every transaction that you do. Or you can use cash or you can use debit or you can use crypto. And there's no taxes that you could do that that is one thing the states can do and it's very effective it's the same thing the u.s government is trying to do right now as they tax or are trying to tax crypto miners so it goes both ways so that is positive maybe a little bit of negative in that one and lastly i just wanted to follow up with with this last piece i thought it was interesting because we had a, a really good show uh me ben and, and guy coin bureau and the cryptoverse and it was our nfa show this was on Thursday, just this week. And one of the things that Guy talked about, I'll link this in the description below, you can check it out. It's a pretty good one. We talked about uh, upcoming recession. We talked about the problems that are going on in the crypto, the meme coins. But one thing that Guy said that stuck with me, and I had to have him repeat it, was he said that central banks passed their own regulation from within, which allowed them to custody crypto in 2025, more specifically Bitcoin, if they really wanted to. And I said, excuse me, Guy, can you say that again? He goes, yeah, we did this video in uh, February, March, and it was 2025. So I, ha I looked through, through Guy's videos, and there's a ton, so I couldn't find it, but it's true. Central banks to enforce standards on banks' exposure to crypto in 2025. Uh, the group of central bank governors and head of supervision, GHOS, endorsed the global Prudential standard for banks' exposure to crypto assets. The group has decided on January 1st, 2025 is the implementation date for that standard. So they're going to allow central banks to put Bitcoin on their ledgers, on the books. And I thought to myself, and this just goes in what we were talking about here. We were talking about uh, a recession coming in. Recessions usually last 10 and a half months to a year. We talked about uh, there's a presidential election coming about. This is in November 2024. And of course, the president will come, uh, will take office, probably a new one, in uh, January 2025. 
And then it all, and then when Guy talked about central banks custodying Bitcoin in 2025, it just kind of hit me. I'm like, holy smokes. I go, this is really coming into play of the four-year cycles. I mean, we talk about this all the time, but just as a reminder, 2012 is a halving. 2013 is an all-time high, dip, and a reset. We did it again. 2016, halving, all-time high, dip, reset. We did it again. In 2020, we had a halving. 2021, all-time high, dip, and a reset. And without further ado, we're going to have a Bitcoin halving around March or April 2024. I don't care who the president is. I don't care if there's a session. I don't care what's going on. Nuclear war, it doesn't matter. There's going to be a Bitcoin halving. It happens every four years. And it's going to happen again. And now we're playing into this narrative of 2025. Could it be the all-time high? Well, it hasn't stopped it so far, but we'll see how it all goes. Just things, it's just eerie how things are lining up. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. That's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, do me a favor, give it a thumbs up. Crypto and digital assets, are, it's not a, a place you need to uh, invest into passively. You really should be up to date, so consider subscribing. That's it for today. So thanks so much for stopping by. I do appreciate you, and I'll see you on the next one.